Uh, what's so special about today? There was a, yeah, good. Yeah, like the kids. He's risen. There was a teacher who asked these kids in their class, a little young Bible study, she said, just like Elaine did, she said, what's so special about Resurrection Sunday or Easter? And one get their hand So that's that's the, the day we go to our grandma's house and we eat a lot of food and turkey and so forth. And it's, no, that's that's Thanksgiving. Anybody else? They raise their hand up. That's, oh, I know, I know, I know. That's the day when we, it's early in the morning and we have this tree, it's lit up, and we have these presents. And no, that's 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 Christmas. Anybody else? And the little kid, I know it. That's, that's when Jesus died on the cross and he went into the tomb. And she goes, that's right. And the kid said, and if he comes out and sees his shadow, we have winter for seven more weeks. <laughs> and so that's not what, what, what's so special. If you're not, if you're new to church or new, maybe you've been, maybe as a child or so forth, but it's been a while. I meet Christians too who don't realize why today is so special. While Christians celebrate the death of Jesus all the time, we can, and through our church services. We have one special day called Good Friday where we celebrate his death. While we celebrate his resurrection all the time, we sure do, there's one day in particular we really like to celebrate that he was raised again, and that's on this day. In the history of the church, the day is called Pasach, Pascha, or Resurrection Sunday, and later on it became known as Easter. So that's why it's so special, because this is at the absolute core heart of what Christianity is about. Christians believe and I believe firmly based on historical evidence that we have really good reason to believe that Jesus of Nazareth really was crucified under Pontius Pilate in the first century and he really was put into a tomb and he really was found empty later, three days, and he really did meet people afterward. And so celebrating an event that had never happened in the history of the planet for which we have record. So Christians get excited about that. We get happy. That's why if you're not used to that, we get happy because who gives a rip? Well, we do. Because we're convinced this is true. Uh, and I'll talk about this later on as well, because you can go to a, the traditional spot where Jesus' tomb is, but he's not there. I mean, you can try to rob the grave, but he's not there. And so for Christians, this is a very special day. Now, if you go to the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there's different accounts of what happened at his resurrection. And he showed up to people. And later on in the early church, they started preaching about that. And there's one text I want to go to this morning that's not a Gospel. It's actually in the early preaching of the church. And this morning, if you can, turn to Acts chapter 2. By the pillars right beside you and behind you are extra Bibles. Please feel free to get the Bibles, the pillars. Your, your phone might have a Bible app. There's Bibles in the back. They'd be happy to bring them to you if you raise your hand. I know Chris wants to do that or Brandon. And so open a Bible at Acts chapter 2. Take your time. Every Bible has a table of contents. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. So it's on the right side of your Bible, the book of Acts chapter 2. Please take the time to find it. Even if you're not a Christian, if you've never touched a Bible, it won't burn your hands for long. It will, uh, I'm, I'm just... Just make sure you're listening. I'm kidding. The book of Acts, and the book of Acts, uh, so Acts chapter 2, verse 14. Now, what's traditionally called, what we call Pentecost, originally was, and still is, a Jewish holiday. It happened right after Passover, Pesach, Passover meal. It was a day where they celebrated first fruits of the seasons and some other, it's a, it's a two-week celebration. But that Passover became something different. On this particular Passover, which happened just a few days after Jesus was raised from the dead, something very special happened. Uh, the earliest Christians, who are all Jewish men and women, they're meeting together, and you can go to the traditional spot this happened. It's called the upper room. We don't know for sure, but I've been there and sang a song. That's cool. It's just an upper room. We're not sure if that's the actual spot. But when they're there... They, in uh, verses 5 and following, they bust in what we call tongues. They start speaking different languages. And that's why I had this picture. The picture's, you know, kind of cheesy, white, old. But anyway, the point is, the point is they start teaching and preaching all of a sudden, and people in the crowd in Jerusalem could hear their language. Uh, we might forget this is important because in Jerusalem at the time period at Passover was their Super Bowl and Mardi Gras all wrapped up into one. And so Jerusalem would have swollen to almost half estimates, up to almost a half a million people. It had been very packed. And people from all over the Roman Empire, if they could make it, came during Passover. So when the disciples go to the temple like they always did after the resurrection, the Spirit does something through them. And they start preaching all of a sudden. People thought they'd gone crazy. And so in chapter 2, verse 14, we want to read about what happened. And I think it's going to help us just want to reflect on the resurrection of Jesus. If you have it, we say amen. Amen. Don't forget to look. Verse 14. But Peter, standing with the eleven, he means Jesus' disciples, he lifted up his voice and he addressed them. Right? There's no microphones. He starts, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you 
and give ear to my words. He's saying, listen up, please listen. For these men are not drunk. They say that in verse 13. These people are drunk. And he says, no, it's just the third hour of the day. I mean, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. Some of you said, what's wrong with that? Well, okay, well, <laughs> they don't usually get drunk early in the morning. No, they're not drunk. They sound like their tongues. No, 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 it's not that. That's not at all. Verse 16, this is very important. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. So what Peter is saying is what you are witnessing right now is something that Joel, an Old Testament prophet, talked about centuries ago. Now it's happening. You're in the presence of God doing something phenomenal. Verse 17, now Peter adds, he says, in, and Peter adds, in the last days. That's actually not in Joel 3. It really says after this, but Joel, Peter wants you to understand, we're in the last days. In the last days, uh, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. That is not just prophets, but anybody will get my spirit. And your sons and your what? daughters will prophesy because when the spirit moves he doesn't care about your gender or your sex he doesn't care when the spirit moves he works through sons and daughters when that happens and your young men are going to see visions your old men are going to dream dreams uh, and yeah my men servants my maid servants in those days i'll pour out my spirits they will prophesy the point is everybody and every single rank of life education economic level when i break through you're going to know it and I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the day of the Lord comes. That means judgment day. Before the day of the Lord comes, that's judgment day. That great and manifest day. And it shall be that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So here he's saying, of course, something very important to these people in Jerusalem. He's saying, listen, you're you're witnessing that we have expression in the South, the proof in the pudding. We're not drunk. You just are experiencing right now God doing something amazing through us. Now, something that's a, that might be true, uh, scholars really are divided. Uh, there's a long, I could nerd out for a while, and I like to do that. I'm a nerd. But uh, the scholars are convinced Jesus either died uh, April 4th, AD 30, or April 3rd, AD 33. If it's AD 33, on that exact year, on that exact day, and we have reasons to think it, it is really one of those days. Uh, and I put that date on my calendar, on my actual calendar. So I go around every April 3rd or 4th. I'll save it to this year. Sometimes on Facebook I'll put that. Uh, this is the actual day he died, which means this actual day he rose from the day grave. That exact year in AD 33, that particular was something called the blood moon. That exact moon would have looked red. So it's possible that Peter's even thinking of the Joel reference because he saw it. It's like that. It's like that. Now today, I'm not going to stay too long on this, but today if you're a skeptic, like I have been, I mean, I'm a skeptical person myself. This kind of stuff can sound like, I mean, spiritual mumbo jumbo. I get it. I mean, I do. These people are speaking in tongues. What does that mean? What, what's David talking about? And today it's very unpopular to believe that there's something called, a person called God, who then does things in the world. And so, for example, if you're a neuroscientist, there's no such thing as that. They're just brain things going on crazy. So some of you might be thinking that this morning. Some of you might think, and when Jesus, when David's talking about the resurrection, this Christianity stuff, it sounds good, but we know deep down it's just a feeling they have. It's just a feeling they have. Christianity teaches the exact opposite of that. We do have feelings, but that's not the basis of it. For example, here's a study one neuroscientist said. They've done all kinds of study. They'll put people on a, on a CAT scan, and they'll scan their brains while they're meditating or singing praise songs. And different parts of the hemispheres glow. So this one person said, uh, Dr. Jordan Graffin, our results are unique in demonstrating that specific components of religious belief are mediated by well-known brain networks. That might be true that they're mediated. That might be true. But here's what he says, and they support contemporary psychological theories that ground religious belief within evolutionary adaptive cognitive functions. If it's too early for you, that means the standard view is the only reason you believe in religion at all is because evolution makes you think that. And so when you look at brain scans, they say that's where it all comes from. So what these people really are having is just kind of a mass hallucination or a delusional experience. I fundamentally disagree with that. I think that's fundamentally false on multiple levels. And since this is not a class on that, what I'm saying is I'm trying to draw a massive contrast between what you and I hear, as it were, in the real world of what happens with religion and Jesus and Christianity. And it sure feels warm fuzzies and good for them. Good for them. All those, those biochemical things in their brain. What Christianity actually teaches is that's not what happened. That something happened to them. 
not a feeling they had, but something happened to them. There's a recent movie that came out. How long is it going to take Julie to catch this one? Does that look familiar on the screen? You can say it. Yeah, No Way Home. I think you're going to say Tom Holland. Spider-Man. You want to see Spider-Man, the new Spider-Man movie? Yeah, thank you. Hey, this is church. You can say that. It's okay. It's not that bad of a movie. Well, in Spider-Man, that movie that just came out, No Way Home, there's a big scene. Uh, it's, and I'll spend the next three hours on this movie because it is, I'm kidding, I won't at all. There's a big scene. The whole theory of the movie, Spider-Man, is that there's a multiverse. And the bad news is this, this magician guy, he does this spell and it goes wrong. And other people's reality is starting to rip through their own universe. And so here's some pictures from the movie that, it, oh my goodness, at the end it builds and builds. It's like a zipper that has been unzipped and reality is separating. And you start seeing these figures on the other side. I do this because that's what I do. When I saw that, I thought, what a good analogy. Early Christians believed, and modern Christians are supposed to still believe, that's exactly what has happened with Jesus' resurrection and the Spirit coming on his people. Reality itself has been unzipped. And Peter is telling the people, I'm telling you, we're not drunk. Something new is happening. There is a new reality that has been a, a reality zipper. And you are seeing glimpses of it right now. This is evidence that the end has started. In the last days, my spirit will come upon you. Reality, as you know, it is not the same. Now, in the movie, spoiler, he, he zips it back up, as far as we know, right? He, zip, he goes back to reality. Cool for him. But in the Christian worldview, that's not what's happened. That the spirit is still active doing things in people's lives right now. So Paul, again, to rephrase it in a way, Paul says this in a sense. God sent his spirit, like Joel promised, to enable his church to do exactly what they're supposed to do, which is share the gospel. We're not drunk. The spirit's saying, go, do what I've trained you to do. And what is that? The day of the Lord's coming. Judgment's coming. Get ready. A sister, well, I can't call you sister and brother in Christ. If you're not a Christian, what that means is from the Christian worldview is that when you and if you and I confess, as he says, right, look in verse 21. It should be that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That means a genuine sense of repentance that I need you. Peter's point is the only way you and I can say that earnestly and honestly is if the Spirit enables us to do it. The Spirit says, it's time. Do you understand? Do you, uh, just by show of hands, how many of you know what I'm talking about? Have you experienced that before when the Spirit says, it's time? Like I've come to the end of me. I'm done with me. And the Spirit says, okay, you get it. You get it. And see, the hard part is a lot of us, particularly us people like me, a nerd, thinker type, we think sometimes well, I can just reason my way there. Well, reason's important. I'm not, don't get rid of reason, my goodness. But this is not a philosophy you just adopt. It's not something you just try to be good at and so forth. No, no, Paul's, Peter's point is that's not the point at all. The Spirit has to do something to you. And the fact is it's good news because we want the reality to split open. We want the Spirit to come inside of us. That's Peter's point. Now, not everyone wants that, and we'll see that in a second. Not everyone wants that today. Some of you in this room, some watching online still don't want that. You just, I came to church because I was dragged here. I get it. All I'm saying is, Peter, so you sure want it. You ought to want to want it. You ought to want to want it. You ought to want it. Then he says this in verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, that's a real historical figure. This isn't Harry Potter or something. This is real. Jesus from the town called Nazareth. He's a man attested to you by God. That is, you've seen it with mighty works and wonders and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. You saw it. That's his point. You've seen him do things no one else does. Exercise demons. He healed people. You've seen and heard things from your own eyes. You saw it. This Jesus, he was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. That is, God, God the Father was not surprised this happened. God the Father was not shocked. You, and it's plural, it's y'all because he's southern, y'all crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Jesus, I mean, Peter certainly doesn't think the people to whom he's immediately talking to, you nailed him, that he knows that it happened. The Romans killed him. His point is, as a group of people, you were all co-conspirators. Some of you in my actual midst, Peter would say, is that part of you at least, or probably the actual crowd right around this corner over here who were screaming out, crucify him. 
So there's a corporate guilt here, a corporate guilt. But, but, and this is the key, God did what? God raised him up. God the Father raised him up, having loosed the pangs of death because I mean, I love, it was not possible for him to be held by it. It can happen. Arise, my love, arise, my love. What? Thank you. Has no hand on you. Death, where's your sting? Now, Paul says later on in 1 Corinthians that, man, death couldn't hold him. It couldn't work. So these three fundamental facts, Christians, we need to memorize them and know them, be able to articulate them in an elevator. And that's what he just said. Jesus from Nazareth, he performed numerous things, signs and acts of God, all that he did that. And he was obedient to the point of crucifixion. And third, God the Father raised him up. If these things are not true, Christianity is false. Well, David, it makes me feel good. It does, again, so do drugs. I mean, things that make you feel good that are false, that are good, not good for you. This is true. And Peter's saying, listen, you all have been there. You know what I'm talking You remember Jesus? Yeah, the guy you were shouting about? You saw him do these things. And they're like, uh-huh, uh-huh, but what's the bad news? This is bad news. It's first got to be bad news before it's good news. That is, you helped him be killed. Now, we might, who cares? In the ancient world, nobody thought a Messiah or a king that God would anoint his king. Nobody thought the king that God would choose to rule his people would be killed. I mean, nobody. We have zero evidence that any Jew ever thought that. If God chose a special person, became an anointed one, the Messiah, that person was going to beat the bad guys. He's going to come into town, and he's going to, you know, purify the temple and kick them all out, and he's going to rule. In fact, Jesus came in, overturned the tables, and then eventually just got killed. And this sermon here, Peter's trying to preach his heart out on us to say, I'm not just making this up. You saw who he was, and only people sent by God can do that, right? And they go, right. Then you had him killed. To show that you were wrong and that God the Father, that Jesus was right, he was raised a new life. And raised up does not mean he was just resuscitated like he had a headache and he was just like, he was drunk or something. He got, drank some coffee. It means he had a, got a, brand new body that will never ever corrupt again ever brand new body he has raised him up now he's not done there but he's going to say more about that I want one more time this man according to your myths we you saw him but God raised him up because even death couldn't hold him then he says in verse 25 for David says now he says that David says this from Psalm 15 for David says concerning him I saw the Lord always before me for he is at my right hand and that I may not be shaken Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to death. You might say Hades, but it's to Sheol, death. Nor let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. So Peter's point is, this is like the psalm uh, that da he says David wrote. And that is a psalm of like, God loves me so much, he won't let me stay corrupt in the grave. And that's what happened to Jesus. Verse 29. Brethren, literally in Greek it says, it is possible to say confidently of the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. And that's true. You can go to the traditional spot where King David is there. Uh, in their time period, they would have pointed to it. I'm not sure which direction he's facing. We can say confidently, he's right over there, right? And everyone would have gone, right, I've been there. I, everybody knows that, Peter. I was raised from childhood. I know that's where his tomb is. I get it. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants upon his throne, he foresaw and spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to death, nor his flesh saw corruption. Now this Jesus, the same Jesus of Nazareth, God raised up, and of that we have all seen him. We're all witnesses. We didn't have a dream about it. We didn't feel good fuzzy feelings. We saw him, verse 33, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this which you see and hear. For David didn't ascend into heavens, but he himself says, this is from Psalm 110, uh, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make my enemies, your enemies are still my feet. And let all the house of Israel therefore know surely that God has designated or made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom y'all crucified. Now, the Psalm 110, he said in my right hand, means my Lord said to my Lord, said in my right hand. And that becomes the number one quoted Old Testament passage in the New Testament. 
It's the way the early Christians thought that Jesus had been raised from the dead. I want that to sink in. The whole point Peter's making here is that you can go down the street and find David's tomb, King David, the King David. If you're, not new, if you're new to Christianity, David's their top dog. He's their favorite king of history. We know where his tomb is. You can go to his tomb. But Jesus is not there. Please let that sink in. If you went there right now to Jerusalem today, he's not there. You know who you would find in their tombs, though? Other places that we find where their graves are? Muhammad. Kung Fu Tse or Confucius, Joseph Smith, the religious leaders of all kinds of different religions around the world. Christians believe very vehemently, I sure do, that the, one of the, the chief distinctions of our religious founders, he's not there in the grave anymore. So when we say he's alive, it's not just an expression. We really do believe he's alive and well. He has a physical body, he's alive and well. His tomb's empty. His tomb's empty. I don't know if you're going to say amen. I, I'm happy about that. I think it's good. Peter's saying, please, do you understand we've been there? And P Peter goes on and says, not only, or, not only is his tomb empty, it still is empty this day, but we're witnesses to it. The evidence, the evidence that he was raised up, he says, is that is at the right hand of God, is that the Holy Spirit has come upon us. That's the sign that Jesus is currently reigning. Why? Because he sends the Spirit to change people right now. He sends people right now, he changes them. I've known people, I've known many people in life whose lives have been, including my own, changed by him. Who know what I'm talking about? Like, he changes you. It's not just a fly. Something happens to you. You have been affected. You've been affected. Something's happened to you. I could tell you stories, and I don't have the time. I won't make the time. I can tell you stories of raging alcoholics who never touch alcohol again when they gave their life to Jesus. I can tell you stories. I can tell people who are, who are addicted to drugs, who gave their life to Jesus and never touched drugs again. I can tell people who were bitter and mad and held grudges at everybody, and they gave their life to Jesus, and they radically transformed the most loving, generous people you've ever met. I know people who are very stingy or materialistic and about money, 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 gave their life to Jesus, and they give it all away. I know people who are businessmen, rich, wealthy businessmen. I'm sure they're women too. I know more of the men's side, and they gave their life to Jesus and gave it all up because they said, God said, I don't want you to have all that stuff. God's not against money. I'm just saying they felt God said, I, I'm too greedy, materialistic. I got to go. And that's Peter's point is that I'm telling you, what's the sign? One of the signs, he's reigning right now, and all the stuff is not in vain, and someone's listening to our songs, is he's still changing people's lives. Did you know right now around the globe, right now, that Christianity is blowing up? Did you know that? Not just from births, but people who meet the risen Jesus. It happens all over the world. All over the Middle East, Muslims and other Arabs and other people of faith, routinely, there's enormous documentation for this, that Jesus shows up to them in dreams. And it's the same figure. They have never gone to church, don't know who, yes, who Jesus, they don't know who he is at all. They've never, not someone come share the gospel and gave them a flyer and a Bible. They've never met him. You know who's, as far as I can tell from the evidence, I've done research, I have never heard a documented case of people having visions of Muhammad or Joseph Smith. Where are they? Why aren't we having dreams about them to say, give your life to me? Why is it only one character in the history of the world that's still doing that? I think it's because he's alive and well. I think he's alive and well. Do You know, ex we're expecting around by the year 2050, there should be almost 3.33 billion Christians around the globe. Right now, we're just over 2 billion. And that's not just about birth, that's by conversions. Did you know that's all over the world? And by 2050, and it's still, it's right now it's true that Africa, there are more African Christians than anybody else, but there'll be almost 1.3 billion by 2050. In Latin America and Asia, that's more than Europe and North America by 2050. They've already, they're already doing it, but people in Africa and China, they're sending missionaries here. They've been doing that for years. Not to mention Europe, they're way behind. They're, that church has fallen so badly, and that's sad, sad. I'm here to tell you, if you're a Christian, you know what I'm talking about. If you're not, I, I'm, I'm imploring you, I'm begging you as a fellow human and historian to ask you to seriously consider the fact of what it means that Jesus has been raised from the dead. What difference that possibly makes in your life. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, I want to talk to you after the service. And then he wraps up in verse 37. In verse 37, stay with me, we're almost done. And now when they heard this, they gave each other high fives. No, it doesn't say that. The Greek literally is they were cut to the heart. They were cut like, oh, have you ever realized something? you've done something really, really wrong? You didn't know you did something really, really, really wrong? 
No, okay, I have. I know what that's like to go, I had no idea. The deep, deep remorse, I like that cut to the heart is a great way to say it, or pierced to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, fellow Jews, what, are we go what should we do? I didn't know that, I didn't know. And Peter said to them, don't worry about it. It's just religion, it doesn't really matter. It's just a preference if you think about it. As long as you feel good. Do you feel good inside? Are you trying to be a good person? Well, then that's it. How often do you go to church? Two times a year? Well, then you're fine. What's the big deal? Do you read the Bible? That's cool. Are, are, you, are you nice to people? Do you, have good, do you have good intentions? Is your heart good? That's good. That's fine. All right, let's have some lunch. That's exactly what we hoped he'd said in our culture. That's what we hoped he'd said, but that's not what he said at all. He said what? Repent. That means to change your ways of what you're doing and do it his way. You have to change your ways and do it his way. And be what? Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, because that's what you need is forgiveness. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children, or to y'all and to all your children, and to all that are far off, everyone whom the Lord God calls to him, everybody. And he testified with many other words and exhorted them, saying, save yourselves from this wicked or crooked generation. Do something about it. So those who received the word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 people. Now, of course, not everyone believed, because there would have been a lot more people than that. Somebody was like, no, I don't care. Well, I don't believe you, and they went home. But the, the only possible, logical, viable solution to your and my guilt is Jesus. Trying to be a good person, helping the homeless, being nicer to your siblings is not the solution to the guilt. My, all my response would be, well, then try it. How's that working out? It doesn't work. And that's Peter's point. Are you good? Are you trying hard? That's cool. There is one solution to the guilt, that's Jesus. And there's only one logical, appropriate response to the guilt, and that is give up. If I were running the wrong way in a race up in this up a hill as hard as I could forever, and they go, What is he doing? I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna make it. You're on the wrong mountain. Where are you going? No, I'm I'm trying to be a good runner. Good, you're going the wrong direction. It's not gonna work. And the only possible solution to that, sister and brother, and the only possible one is to repent and to confess because of the resurrection of Jesus. Now I'm done. Now the service isn't over, but I'm done. And we're going out to the real world like normal, and we're we'll going out here in our routines, we'll go to our car and go back to the, the grind of life and to-do list and emails and jobs. Some of you are getting anxious just thinking about it. What's for lunch? You know, bills to pay. Habits we've always had. Addictions we've always struggled with. Communication patterns we have. What? I'm going to talk to Christians for a second. Just Christian for a second. What difference does this make in your life at all? I mean, really, though. Do you leave Sunday and go, oh, but that was a good service? What does that mean to be a good service? That you were made happy? That you had a good emotional experience? Really, I'm, you, know, you don't have to answer me out loud. I'm, we, we, we are, I was so good. Good. What does that mean? If, if I asked someone, I, I had a, in June 1999, I got married. How was your wedding? It was so good. Oh, it was good. It was good. Man, I was so pumped up. Oh, I was pumped up. Good. How's the marriage? I don't know. What do you mean? I don't understand. <laughs> what? The marriage. How's it going? I mean, that was years ago. Well, I don't understand. But you said your wedding day was a good day. Oh, boy, it was good. Oh, man. She was hot. I was handsome. Oh, we look, oh man. Well, how's the marriage? I don't, I don't know. What marriage? How weird would that be, the disconnect between having an event versus a life that's been changed? I mean, really? In conversations out at Walmart or wherever, Sullivan's, wherever you go, I mean, really, do you think for a second, he's alive? When you're stressed out at work and home and you're, and just, you're just freaking out, car broke down again, he walked out again, she did this thing again, she had one more drink and he said he wouldn't do it. it what's your first gut reaction? Is it he's alive? I need to go to the resurrected Jesus to say, help me. Help me. What do you want me to do? Or is it I'll do it my way, or I'll throw a fit, or I'll be entitled? What do you do? When it goes to spend your money this week, when you go to spend your money, when you spend the hard-earned cash that you've got, and you say, I'm going to spend this money and buy this and this, do you think he's alive? 
I wonder what he wants my money on. Huh. When I'm in a conversation sitting beside a person over coffee or I'm, I'm texting someone I haven't talked to in a while and I go, I wonder how so-and-so, do I go, huh, I don't know if they're a Christian and I want to see them face-to-face at judgment. As a matter of fact, he's alive. How, how would that change how I talk to that person? What possible difference does it make? To the non-Christian in the room, will you be like the person who repented or will you be like everybody else that said, not for me, man? You get to decide, just like I did. Would you pray with me right now? We ask, Lord Jesus, for the help to do it your way, and we are so thankful that you are alive. So, so, well, those of us that believe it are very, very thankful. I am so thankful, so thankful that we can meet together as sisters and brothers in Christ and be reminded of this fundamental message that you died for us. Your death did something for us and that your resurrection proves it. Lord Jesus, thank you for still changing people's lives around the world. I'm so glad. I'm so glad also that all it takes is for us to repent, that we don't have to work up and be a good boy or girl before we meet you face. I'm just so glad about that because I would fail so miserably. Thank you, Jesus, for that grace. Oh, my goodness. Help us as sisters and brothers in Christ who have made that decision on resurrection, whenever that happened, that we believed in you and put our trust in you. Help us get re If we're off focus, if we're off track, help us get back on track, please. Get refocused on you. And whatever nonsense we're doing that is not like you, Jesus, please help us stop that to make sure our values and our behaviors are indicative of people who really do believe you have died for us and rose from the grave for us and reigning and ruling all over. For those in the room right now, those watching online who don't know you, they don't know what I'm talking about, or maybe they're intrigued a little bit, and maybe right now, Spirit, you're making them feel kind of nervous and excited at the same time. Please keep doing that great work. Please help them surrender to you and help us be part of that solution if possible to be a safe place for everybody who has questions or doubts or curiosity. I'm so glad with you we are safe. We thank you for being the one raised from the dead. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.